Okay, right, well it's uh, good to be here today and um, the week's going by real fast. We're coming up to Christmas. It seems like we just had a Christmas and now it's just around the corner again. <laughs> the years go by, don't they? And we're enjoying our uh, temperatures at the moment, although uh, had got a bit cold a couple of mornings there. But uh, the fresh air and the blue skies just recently have been really enjoyable. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time we've got together to open the Scriptures. Lord, we ask for Your guidance and help in understanding them and applying them to our very lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're on Ephesians and we're up to uh, verse 11 of chapter 2. Um, just by way of sort of review, um, up here we've got Ephesians 2.8 which we looked at last time. And this particular verse is a tremendous verse. It's always been one that's striking. Um, however, there are some difficulties in interpreting this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And I was pointing out last time that um, the that there, and that, not of yourselves, many people will link that to this antecedent here, the faith. So, they read it like this. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves. That faith, it is the gift of God. See, that's how it would be read by some people. And I pointed out last time that that has big problems. It has problems grammatically because the gender of this word that is neuter. And the gender of this word faith is feminine. And so the rule of grammar is that the, the uh, genders should match, and they don't. So I pointed out that really the best way to interpret that is to say, well, when it says, and that, it means this whole idea that salvation by grace through faith, that idea is not out of yourselves. It's the gift of God. There it is here. <laughs> okay, the gift of God. And we went through some of these ideas about, you know, speech and good works and how it is that the two should run together. Um, good works certainly should follow. In Titus, we have a tremendous passage here about looking for those good works. And speech, yes, sometimes speech can be easy. Good works following can be a bit hard. Um, and in verse 10 it says, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 it says, By grace are you saved through faith in that, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so it puts works in the correct place, and then it follows immediately and says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, there's the word, unto good works. See, it puts it in the right order. It puts works in the, the correct place. And a lot of pe people get this topsy-turvy in their lives. And so it is that religions many times have this completely around the wrong way. That people are trying to earn salvation by doing whatever is prescribed. Whatever good works are prescribed, they'll try and do these things to appease an angry God. You know? And many times he can be very angry. And you've got to somehow appease this angry God by your good works. And the Christian faith has it in such a logical order. I like this because I know in my own life, no one has to tell me this. I know I cannot earn my salvation because it's tainted. All my good works are tainted by something. And I need God to reach down to me and save me where I am, and that's what he's done, and the scriptures uh, have this beautiful teaching uh, for us. We, sh we looked at this word creation, um, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, created in Christ Jesus, that there was this uh, plan and purpose that goes back before the foundation of the world, a predestination for which marks out an inheritance for us in this particular age, and that we are now put into a place through the work of Christ to actually perform the correct kind of works, works that would be pleasing unto him. And we looked at some of these passages about the new man, um, 
Notice in red here, all things by Jesus Christ, new man. It's all to do with a tremendous work of God prepared for us that we can perform through his um, apportioning of grace. Now, this is where we're up to. <laughs> Statistics. <laughs> I see some scared looking faces here. <laughs> um, so here is a kind of an interesting picture, I guess. These G's here, they stand for Gentiles. There's 70 of them. And then there's a, you can't really see this, I need me to make it a bit bigger, but there's an I there, and that's for Israel. And what you find is in the Bible, you'll f find this very clearly delineated that, yeah, there are plenty of Gentile nations. In fact, Gentiles just means nations. And you may see some of them will group together, they'll cluster together by some form of similarity, but they are clustered together separate from Israel. Israel is always separate. And the idea of distance comes up in this. And what I want to do is I want you to read with me Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 11. It says this, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past. When it says time past, it's a Greek word, pate. Pate, in time past, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision. Now, the idea of the flesh comes up here. The idea of things done in the flesh come up. And a priority given to a nation. It says, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now, isn't it interesting? It says, called by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh. The circumcision calls the others the uncircumcision. You notice that it's not God here represented as calling them the uncircumcision. It's the circumcision that calls the others the uncircumcision. We are seeing a building up of an enmity in here. There's an enmity going on which needs to be resolved. And it is resolved in here. And it says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Man, what a list, you know. That's a list to make you wake up. Yeah, you'll find yourself amongst some of these nations and some of them could be quite amazing in their accomplishments. Have you looked at ancient history, at some of the accomplishments of some of the great pagan societies like Egypt? I mean, if you were to look at Egypt today, it's a complete mess. If you look at yesteryear and go back in the ages, there was a glory to the Gentiles in, in the Egyptian dynasties, the pharaohs and all that they accomplished. And we're not saying that they had the right or the correct truth, but you have to say that they made some sort of an accomplishment, some sort of a society which built these massive pyramids and, and all sorts of other things they did. They were people who were mathematicians, they looked at the stars, they did all these things. Yeah, they had some kind of earthly glory that was there, but they were definitely separated from this one nation, Israel. Um, it goes on, it says in verse 13, but now, but now. And that's a wonderful uh, expression, but now. It indicates a great change has taken place. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Afar off. Just look at this passage with me. So here comes the distance. You see, afar off. I want you to go back to the book of Psalms. Psalm, let's see, it's around about 148. And verse 14. It says this, Psalm 148, verse 14. He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Distance, near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Israel was near unto God. 
And what were the Gentiles? Well, they were afar off. Have a look at while you're in the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, uh, verse 7. And it says this. Deuteronomy, chapter 4, and verse 7 says, For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them? as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. Yeah, what nation is there so great? You know, go talks about Israel, the place it had. There's lots more passages that we, we can multiply through Jeremiah and show you how close Israel was and how far off the Gentiles were. Distance. Distance is a theme that's coming up here in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and these verses that are following. How is this going to be reconciled? And um, so we go in chapter 2 verse 13 of Ephesians. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, who, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Powerful, isn't it? The blood of Christ is very powerful. Um, and it says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one. Both. Both. Now, all these groups here are just called Gentiles. They're just Gentiles. And made both one. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And here's an interesting picture. Because here we have a partition here. And around about this, and this is an artist's impression of what it would have been like during the days of Jesus. They had round about this outside uh, placards written in Greek and Latin, according to Josephus. They, they were written around here. And we actually have, in the 1800s, there was this one found, which was placed around there, written in Greek. And the translation goes like this. No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone, whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death which will follow. Middle wall of partition there. Middle wall of partition. You think of the book of Acts. The temple was there. The temple was standing. Peter, yeah, he, you know, he was baptized and he could uh, show... Ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God would manifest all sorts of miracles in his life. Cornelius, a Gentile, also he experienced water baptism. He had the baptism of the Spirit. He experienced gifts of the Spirit. But when it came to the temple, Peter could enter and Cornelius could not. He would be left outside. Now here comes a very interesting thing to consider here. Because in verse 14 it says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And so here we have again, you can see that starting way back here in verse 11, uh, concerning the circumcision, calling the uncircumcision, and then... Down here, we're seeing the middle wall of partition being broken down. That's the, the now time. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. You see, you've got to keep this in its context. Because the context now is dispensational teaching. It's all about two nations, if you like. Well, the nations, we'll call that like a nation. And then Israel, the nation. The nations versus the nation. And the problem that developed there, the problem that existed between the, the Gentiles and the one nation. That's a problem. How is it going to be dealt with? Well... Here we have it. And uh, it says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. Thereby, the enmity. 
This is not the enmity between each individual and God as a sinner, but rather the enmity between these two groups. You know, it's quite interesting. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. Now, what you have here is uh, something interesting too. And the way that it's often taught is this. The way it's taught is, oh, well, here's the middle wall of partition, and here are the promises and the blessings of Israel. And over here are the Gentiles. And the way it's more or less taught by many is, oh, well, the middle wall of partition has been broken down, and so now the Gentiles uh, have been made one with Israel, and they now partake of the blessings and the promises of Israel. See, and that's the way it is often taught. But it's exactly the opposite, my friends. Because what's actually happened is that the middle wall of partition has been broken down so that a new man can be created. Something new can be created. Not a refurbishing, a fixing up of something that's old, but rather the creation of something new. And both groups are made one in that. And that's, that's a big thing. It's, it's not a small idea. And I want to show you a passage which I think um, is quite interesting. And it's found here in the book of 2 Corinthians. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> and this will be rehearsed again as we go through some of these passages. But I'm sort of laying a bit of a foundation here as we go through. 2 Corinthians 5. So 2 Corinthians, well, we are right in the book of Acts. So we open up 2 Corinthians. We're in the book of Acts. During this time, you're going to find people will be speaking in tongues. They have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Israel is first. All these things are going on in this time that we're, we're reading from. It says this, <clears throat> um, verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Okay, so all were dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And as, we won't read it all, but as you go down, you, you read this in verse uh, 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, although God did beseech you by us. We pray you, and Christ did, be you reconciled to God, for he hath made him... That's God the Father hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what you've got here in the book of Acts is a ministry of reconciliation. So here we've got this, this ministry of reconciliation going on. And then... He says there in, in this context that now we do not know Christ after the flesh. Okay? We do not know. <laughs> Run out of room. Christ after the flesh. Right there. That's in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, that's fine. But in that same time, during this time, we know very well that Paul was sent to go to the Jew first. It was Jew first. Paul says in Romans 15, 8, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Yes, so 
It was due first all through here. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first, Romans 1, 16. Jew first, all the way through here. Yeah, but at the same time, when Christ came to someone and they realized their sin, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. It's the same God that saves them, and it's the same way. It's salvation by grace through faith. We understand that. Yeah, and in that sense, don't know Christ after the flesh. But in terms of dispensational privileges, it was Jew first. Salvation was open to all and was freely given. Now, when you come over here and you jump across the end of the book of Acts, Acts 28, you jump across it, Acts 28, 28, for the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, that they will hear it. You jump across there. What do you find here? Well, you find the same thing here. It's certainly concerning personal salvation. There's no difference. And we don't know Christ after the flesh. That's true. That's correct. But something else. Something else. There is no dispensational advantage given to the Jew. So this idea of not knowing Christ after the flesh now is extended dispensationally. All the other nations realize this. Do you see what I'm saying here? Can you see that there's an adjustment? This truth is there. Yes, personal salvation, the ministry of reconciliation. People could come to Christ. And it didn't matter about the fact that Christ was a minister of the circumcision. It didn't matter. And personal salvation, yes, that's true. But when we cross the border here, there has to be an adjustment. There's an adjustment that's made. And if you don't take the adjustment, then there's going to be a problem. You'll find it difficult to understand the scriptures. And furthermore, there's other things that we're going to come across here. Ordinances. You're going to have problems understanding, well, how on earth should I live my life? What, what things should I do to please God? Well, they were baptized then. They observed the Lord's Supper. Maybe we ought to do these things too today. Maybe, maybe not. You're confused. You don't know. God is not the author of confusion. So carrying on, it says this. In verse um, 17, Therefore, if any man... Oh, sorry, in Second Corinthians, we're carrying on to Ephesians 2. And verse number um, 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. Ordinances. What is this word that is an ordinance? Well, it's this word. Dogma. Dogma. You dogmatic? <laughs> well, you've got some ordinances that you're, you can definitely believe in. You know? Dogma. This word is used in various places in the Bible. Um, let's have a look at um, one of these places. Um, let me find it for you. Um, it's in the book of Acts. And there was a picture I was going to show you as well. Okay. You've got too many pieces of paper here. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. <laughs> and we'll back up to 15, I should say. <laughs> Acts chapter 15, um, <clears throat> verse 25. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who also who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. 
for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Now this is important. You'll notice it says, for it seemed good. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves you shall do well, fare you well. These are the um, ordinances that were given and passed on during the book of Acts to the church. Notice it included blood. Blood. What's blood? Well, blood from animals. Um, black sausage, if you've ever had such a thing, which is made out of blood. And these ordinances were given. Why were they given? They were given in order that they, the Gentile peoples would not offend the Jewish believers. That formed a part of this middle wall of partition that was built up between the Jews and the Gentiles. Let's try and get a clearer picture of the problem. You see, the problem is bigger than you think. You just imagine a church during the book of Acts. Let's take the Corinthian believers. Here's a picture of the Corinthian believers. In there, there would be some Jews, some Jewish believers. Okay, so in here, there's a, a group of Jewish Christians. And then there'll be the Gentile believers. So in here, you would you would have a position where, yes, they would understand that according to um, 2 Corinthians 5, yes, they would understand that salvation was to them just as it was to the Jews and that they would understand salvation by grace through faith, Jews and Gentiles alike. There's no difference in that regard. But when it came to national privileges, yes, they would exist. So that's why when you come to various passages like in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 12, you'll find that there is a, a demarcation going on between the two groups. In some cases, Paul will talk to the Jews within the fellowship, reminding them about the place they had as the nation of Israel, the privileges they had. And then he'll talk to the Gentiles in there. And there'll be this to and fro that would go on in there. Um, maybe, maybe we should look at that a little bit closer. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it says this, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All our fathers. Well, the Gentile believers in Corinth would not relate to that statement. All our fathers were not in that group. The Gentile fathers wouldn't be there. So he's addressing the Jews within that fellowship. If you go across to chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now he's addressing the Gentiles within the same congregation. The same congregation would have this going on. Now, jumping the border and moving into the new land, there is a massive movement here. Yes, some things remain the same, but then there is something else which happened. The formation of something new. And when something new occurs, old things are supposed to pass away. We can gain that principle by looking back into this book of 2 Corinthians. Old things should pass away. You know what people are doing, though, is they're grabbing things in here and ripping them forward. They're trying to bring them forward. And they're trying to resurrect things from another age and make them work today, which will never work. It will never happen. Okay, let's, let's carry on, because I think otherwise we... If we stay around here, we won't get much done. So let's get, get into Ephesians um, in chapter 2. And it says this, <clears throat> And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, this is verse 16, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were... Oh, here we back again at distance. The theme of distance is here. Preach before, uh, peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh preached peace and came who came Christ came how did he come well 
He came over here in chapter 4. Look at it. It says this in verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So here he is. He's working again. Christ came in the person of Paul in this case to bring this tremendous ministry. And isn't it interesting how it says, and came and preached peace. What peace is he talking about? He's talking about this enmity between these two groups. It's a dispensational passage. It's all about fixing up national privileges for the age in which we live. And unfortunately, people, this is still a problem that has not been fixed for many Christians. They're still trying to sort this out. And it says, um, <clears throat> and verse 17, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off. Look at the order. The order. Who comes first? Israel coming first or the Gentiles? Look what it says. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off. Gentiles first. And then it says, And to them that were nigh. Well, why do they need to be preached peace? If the message is all just about the reconciliation of 2 Corinthians 5, then what's all this business about preaching peace to those that are nigh? It's a dispensational problem that he's addressing here. National privileges. Preach, preaching peace to those that are far off first and then to those that are nigh. It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. When you start to dig this this stuff, man, it's it's deep, it's real, it's not on the surface, and it's beautiful. Okay. Now it says this, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. We both have access. We both have access. Yeah. In the new man. Look at this. Verse 15. And here is a thought that I brushed by and I need to give it to you straight. I got an email uh, from a person that went to rightdivision.com and asked me some questions. And as I went through these questions, I could see this person does not want a whole lot of stuff. He wants the answer to his question. One of the problems we have as Bible teachers, I think, for, for too long, we dance around these things. We, we do a dance around the question. And what we need to do is say, here's the answer. Or if you don't know the answer, be straight and say, don't know. You know what I mean? You need to be straight and not put on any kind of pretense. Now look at this. I'll try and give you a straight answer to this. It says this. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contain in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. One new man. So, making peace. In this way making peace by making one new man okay why why did he make one new man now we know the gender of this is masculine not by the context right here but later on in chapter 4 he's, he talks about the perfect and in that context this man is in fact male but so putting it back in here we know the gender is male if you go back here and you look at the metaphors used, you've got the wife, you've got the bride, right? And they're definitely f female. Then you jump across here to the new man and it's male. A new figure, a new metaphor is used for this new group. A new group has been formed. Okay, that's cool. But still, why new man? Well, knowing Jesus after the flesh. Just look at this passage. Just, I just thought about it now. Look at Romans 9.5 and look at this and see if you can get the point about the new man. In Romans 9 and verse 5, you have there a passage which relates to 
that glory and the privilege that was given to Israel. It says, Whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh? Remember, that's how it began here today. Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Yeah, the flesh. National privileges related to the flesh. That's Israel, right? Israel had these things. When Christ came as Messiah, he came to Israel. I am not sent, but unto the last sheep of the house of Israel. He came as the Messiah to Israel. Oh, wait a minute now. When we jump across this boundary, my friends, as I said, henceforth know we no man, we know, know we Christ no more after the flesh, so it is also nationally, well, then a new man has to be created. We don't know him after the flesh. Not only in terms of you know personal salvation, but also nationally, no privileges would be given. A new man created. New man. His body created in Christ Jesus. And it goes on in um, Ephesians and chapter number 2 it says in verse 17 and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father we have access immediate access we don't have that kind of immediate access in ages by now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners you know just as a foreigner it's never nice to just remain as a foreigner, you know, it's not. You, you, want, you want to be a part of the group, you know, you do. And is this a blessing here? Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the nation of Israel? No, with the saints, with the saints and of the household of God. Now, isn't this interesting? Because now he's going to start talking about this building. Here we have this middle wall of partition in the temple. Now look what he says. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Which ones are those? Those are the ones that were assigned in chapter 4 verse 11. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy Temple in the Lord. Temple. Isn't it interesting that you have a temple here? Right? But the temple here is something that shows you the dispensational advantage of the group. Not of one nation over another. Or group of nations. It says, In whom all the building fitly framed the growth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Because that's where God has his habitation, in the temple. And dispensationally you can see that we are part of this. Now look at this. I forgot this point as I went through. Which I think is important. Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But shouldn't it be the foundation of Jesus Christ? If he was only talking about recon personal reconciliation, then yes, it has to be Jesus Christ as our foundation. But if he's talking about how we are dispensationally to be united together in this new man, then it's right and proper that he would put down here the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Those that are mentioned in 4.11. And it says here, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So Christ is in there. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the part that, that locks it all in place. The cornerstone does that. It makes it lock together. But the foundation there is the apostles and prophets. Um, so there's some, some wonderful uh, truths that have come out in there. Um, I didn't go through the business of the ordinances, which I'm out of time for doing, but we can look at that next time and just show you what the ordinances were, those things that um, formed this partition. We saw part of them in the dogma that was, you know, given in the book of Acts, it built up this middle wall, but it's also mentioned again in the book of Colossians. 
Okay, right. Well, that's us for today. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we've had together in the book of Ephesians and all the truths that are there, the blessings that are ours in Christ. And we ask, Lord, that You'd guide us and lead us in all things. In His name we pray. Amen.